Hello everyone, my name is Sydney, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the Digital Marketing and Communications Coordinator at Ontario Presents. I am an Asian woman with long hair and bangs wearing a white sweater. And for this month's Meet the Artist Spotlight, I am joined today by an extraordinary opera singer and theatre creator, Taya Kasahara. Before I begin the interview, I just want to remind everyone the captions are available for this interview, and you can find the transcript for this interview on our website, link in the description below. Taya, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today for our Meet the Artist Spotlight. We'll start off with a quick icebreaker question. Can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Sydney. Um, again, my name is Taya. I'm a mixed Japanese um, white settler. I have um, short, dark-ish hair that's pulled back. I'm wearing a gray uh, sweater. Um, I'm here in Toronto in Treaty 13 lands, um, colonially known as Toronto, Ontario, and um, I identify as a trans non-binary um, person. I'm an artist, opera singer, theater creator, um, like you said in your intro, and my pronouns are they and them. Wonderful. We'll just kind of do a quick dive into your work. So at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, you started a project called 19 Videos for COVID-19, where you performed 19 different musical pieces, including old favorites and socially distant collaborations from your balcony. Can you share with us what the planning process for this project looked like and how did the project kind of evolve throughout those 19 days? Definitely. Um, well, first of all, there was no plan in place. It was uh, very spontaneous. Um, it was motivated by um, shock and surprise of what was going on in our industry, in the world, um, uncertainty, and this need to connect and need to share uh, my art and to perform. Um, and I had noticed that on Twitter, um, people in Italy were singing songs and performing with each other on their balconies in these different apartment complexes, um, singing songs, but also, you know, playing different instruments. And I thought that was really special and really beautiful, especially when we knew nothing about um, COVID-19 and people were dying and, and getting really sick. So I decided to sing something off my balcony and I was really uh, fortunately surprised that there was a great acoustic out here um, my balcony um, faces more condo buildings and the lake, Lake Ontario. So um, as I sang out and I had, I had a boom box that I was, um, had some accompaniment. It was, the first song was um, Bach Gunos Ave Maria that I sang. And so I sang that and a lot of people were cheering and applauding down on the street level and also came out onto their balcony. So I could see, I'm, I'm looking out the window right now. So I could see different people um, also wave and, and say hello and witness the, the song. And um, immediately people were yelling encore. So I just did the whole thing all over again. And I also decided to record it. So my wife who was with me, Mel, she recorded it on my iPhone and then we posted it on social media to share with um, friends and family that we couldn't see and that were across the country as well and also in, in the States and abroad. So it just kind of um, blew up from there. It's like, okay, this was a great experience. It was um, very like random and spontaneous and I decided, okay, let's do some more of this. And that's how, that's how the planning started was after that. <laughs> That's wonderful. I kind of like how you took your balcony, kind of turned it into this kind of impromptu stage in a way, just to kind of like facilitate the kind of community gathering that wouldn't have been possible during the lockdown. So it's kind of great to see music kind of being used as this vehicle to connect people from near and far and from over the world through the power of the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Yeah, I was really, I was really surprised by actually like people reaching out from like South Africa, Brazil, Chile, you know, across Europe. Um, and I could share it also with my, my family in Japan, you know, so literally a global, it had a global reach, which was really powerful for me to, um, to be a part of that, to witness it on the other end. Yeah. Awesome. 
So I want to quickly shift gears over towards your opera-inspired solo theater show, The Queen and Me, which centers around the Queen of the Night from Mozart's The Magic Flute, as she becomes a metaphor for silenced and other women within the operatic canon and within the opera industry. What was your inspiration behind the choice to focus on The Queen of the Night, as opposed to characters like Lady Macbeth or Manon Lesko? Yes. So the character... The Queen of the Night, um, that role I had sung many times in my career thus far um, and had done different productions um, here in Canada and also in Europe. And the trend that I was noticing was that you just kind of jump in. It's a very quick rehearsal process because we're expecting the Queen to behave in a very kind of two-dimensional way that she is an ambitious woman, wants this power back and uses her daughter to try and get it. And also uses her position as a woman or her womanly wiles to get what she wants. And I felt frustrated with that, um, that there was not so much um, exploration in the depth of her character as a woman, as a, um, a woman who was maybe usually overlooked as just being evil or ambitious like I said before and she sings for maybe a total of 10 to 12 minutes in this entire opera however um, people go home after seeing this opera always humming her famous melody with those high notes so I had this idea to ask questions about you know, what is she doing off the stage? Because she's spending more time off the stage, behind the stage or behind the stage backstage than she is actually on the stage singing and taking up space. So I was started to explore that. And what came of that was exploring how we push aside, dismiss women in general in this industry, but also in the repertoire. And we keep um, presenting these narratives of women either as these um, very innocent angel-like characters who are young and who are naive or the opposite women who are experienced old evil ambitious emotional irrational these kinds of things and usually they end up dying um, in, in some sort of fashion so I wanted to explore the complexity of being a woman, playing a woman character, womanhood. And because I am someone who has experience of womanhood, um, that was something um, closely connected to, to my experience and my heart and wanting to um, change the narrative and be in control of this story. Awesome. And I think it's really great that in The Queen and Me, you're kind of using this as a platform to kind of break out of the roles that kind of society and I guess the opera canon kind of demands and expects from women and just trying to show that you don't have to kind of fit into the mold. You can just be who you are and live your own truth. And that's a really important message to send to the audience. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, thank you. I want to dive a little bit into the behind the scenes of the making of The Queen and Me. Um, you mentioned in the making of The Queen and Me video that you were working with a dramaturge who had no prior experience in opera. Was there a specific reason you chose to work with a dramaturge with no opera experience in contrast to working with a dramaturge with experience in opera? Um, so the dramaturge that I was working with is also one of the co-directors of The Queen and Me, Andrea Donaldson, who's also the artistic director of Nightwood Theatre. Um, and I was actually, when I was first creating this show, I was part of the Emerging Creators Unit at Buddies in Bad Times Theatre. So we were um, kind of placed with these with these director dramaturge, dr turges, dramaturges. Um, and so um, I was very fortunate and happy to meet someone new within the theater industry here in Toronto. Um, and so it wasn't really like a choice, but it was just kind of um, that was uh, suggested for me. And I was I was very happy to to try that experience with Andrea. And I'm very happy I did because we're great friends now and we've been working together ever since. 
I guess that was, yeah, six years ago now, seven years ago, something like that. And um, yeah, six years. And so, um, yeah, it's been, it, it was really interesting because I had to express myself in using vocabulary and language that um, Andrea would understand in terms of where I was coming from, the experiences that not, not only I was going through, but um, what other maybe sopranos, mezzo-sopranos, people who are singing these types of characters would, would be uh, going through in the industry and what, um, and what kind of um, positions they would have to be putting themselves into. So it helped me really clarify actually um, the intention of of my story or of my text through every scene and what I wanted to say with the text. So um, because there was less kind of insider terminology that was going on between say a dramaturge and myself, um, I, th it, I think it was a great way to be, um, to really start off the work of the show and and the de the development of the show in a way that many people can find an entry point who like maybe not might not know anything about opera or who might be huge opera fans so there's an entry point for kind of everyone i feel for this show i can definitely agree with that i am personally someone who has no opera experience whatsoever but i remember watching the trailers and the making of The Queen and Me. And I just remember being so invested in both the process and the actual development of the story and the story itself, just because in some ways, I feel like The Queen and Me kind of acts as a mirror where it's kind of reflecting the experiences of so many people back at them through the lens of art and through opera. So I definitely understand what you mean in terms of people with kind of no experience like me seeing this as kind of like an entry point to opera in a way. So mm -hmm. yeah, thank you so much for answering that question. As we're wrapping up this interview, is there anything else that you would like to share? Do you have any upcoming work that we should be on the lookout for? Yeah, um, I'm doing a lot more performing now that as, as things are opening up, which is wonderful. Um, so my next project will be working with some young singers um, with Tapestry Opera on this workshop called New Opera 101. So we'll be working closely together on new operatic repertoire, and then we'll all be performing it um, for a little concert that'll be at the end of April. Um, I'm also working on a quasi Japanese opera composed by um, Toronto based um, Japanese musical artist Kokichi Kusano. The project is called Nae, which means seedling, and that will be at the Harborfront Centre the first week of May. And then I'm doing um, an opera with the Canadian Opera Company called Pomegranate at the beginning of June. And then I'm going to be doing um, my butterfly project, which is an ever evolving ongoing exploration of the Japanese melodies that Puccini used and appropriated in his opera, Madama Butterfly. And we'll be doing a live performance. I'm bringing on some collaborators um, from Vancouver um, that's with the Toronto Summer Music Festival on July 12th. So lots of different things. <laughs> awesome. So many great things to be on the lookout for. All right. Well, thank you so much, Taya, for taking the time to sit down with us and to participate in our Meet the Artist Spotlight. You can find Taya's social media handles in the description box below and at the bottom of the transcript for this video. Thank you so much for watching this video, and we look forward to seeing you in our next Meet the Artist Spotlight. Thank you, Sydney. <laughs>